We're in Philippians chapter 3. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, having this mind, and if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of one same mind. If there's any kids seven and younger who are wanting to go to Children's Church, y'all's dismissed. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. And uh, we've been continuing our study in the book of Philippians. And I hope that you've been enjoying that, uh, that you've been enjoying the, the, the book of Philippians and you have been uh, following along with what we started with. We started and I, I gave everybody a pair of silverware and I said, we're going to dig into the meat of the scripture. And I hope that you've been doing that. I hope that you've been thinking about that and saying, how can I go deeper with my relationship with the Lord? And uh, today, as we go into chapter 3, this sermon is entitled, Running the Race, Overcoming the Stuff of Life. And so, uh, you know, I want to encourage you, you know, we've been looking, last week we were looking at putting others in, in, in place of ourselves, that we were looking to other people's needs, to being humble and following Jesus' example. And today we're going to be looking at the stuff of life because we all have stuff in the life in our life, right? We all have things that constantly, you know, vie for our attention. You know, hey, what about this? What about this? What about this? We all have those those difficulties, those challenges. We all have, you know, we all struggle with the the combat pride in our life. And you know, well, I you know, I, I want to do things my way and how I I want it. And and we're going to be looking at. Paul writing to us and writing to the Philippian church and talking to them about running the race to continue on. You know, I I love, and in the back of the church, there's a little statue that I'm glad is always in the back of the church. It's it's of Jesus uh, being baptized by John the Baptist. And why I love having that in the back is, is whenever I look out, I always see it in the corner of my eye. I always remember that he's who we're running this race for. He's who our goal is. He's, you know, it's not for us to get glory. It's not for us to get fame. It's not for us to get out of boys. It's to make our Savior proud, to make him happy, that he can look at us and say, well done, good and faithful servant, when we cross the finish line. And that is, that is my greatest goal. I hope it's your greatest goal as well, that, that when we finish this race of life, that we can stand before our Savior and we, he will tell, tell us, well done, good and faithful servant. And so let's take a look at, uh, at Philippians chapter 3. But I want to ask you a question. Does stuff get in the way of your life? You know, here's a couple of people, you know, these are, these are some younger kids and, and that sort of thing. But um, I think many of us probably uh, can, can relate. You know, this poor guy here, he's, he's in the video game mode. You know, it, that could be sports, that could be whatever. You know, all the distractions of life, you know, all the things that wants to take our attention and just... Keep us focused on it. Um, you know, all the flashing lights and the bells and whistles. You know, we tend to be, have you ever noticed we tend to be a little bit like a, a cat or, or an animal? You know, we, is we see the new flashing thing, the new thing that tries to catch our attention. We're like, whoa, what's that? That looks neat. And we're just focused. This other lady over here, she's, she's dealing with social media. You know, I, people get trapped in this all the time. It seems like an addiction today. I mean, if you have a phone and you have Instagram or, or uh, Facebook or all these different things, you, you know, you're scrolling and what's going on and, oh, and liking this picture and, and, you know, you post something and you're wondering why am I not getting like a million likes and why are people not paying attention and, and, and people get absorbed into this. In fact, you know, for the first while, you remember when cell phones first came out and social media came out that people were walking like and falling into manhole covers and like falling into fountains and stuff because they were they were walking around like this. You know, that, that's kind of a bad thing, isn't it? You know, people are just constantly focused on everything else, but they miss what we should truly be focused on, you know, because this life is temporary. It's an illusion. You know, I, I've used this example many times, but. But for those that's in the military, you know, this is boot camp. You know, boot camp is one of those things that you probably have lots of memories of and you go, they weren't exactly pleasant memories. (laughs) 
you know, there, there, there were this difficult time. And that's, that's what this life is. It's, you know, the people ask, you know, well, what's the meaning of life? And, and I, I boil it down. I said there's two questions that you can really boil down the meaning of life. The first one, you have to answer the first one before you can get to the second one. The first one is, what are you going to do with Jesus? You know, we, we have Jesus as presented in front of us, God's Son. Are we going to accept the gift that He gives, that, that He says He is God's Son who died for us to be forgiven and, and restored to relationship with God the Father, that things can be how it was meant to be? And then the second question is if we say, yes, I, I want you, Jesus. I want to have that relationship. I want to have that relationship with God restored. The second is the Great Commission. Jesus tells us, go ye therefore, go and make disciples. Tell others about me. Let them know the good news. And do you realize the greatest news that, that, the, that God who spoke the universe into existence sent his son to die for us, that he took all the sins of the world... That all we have to do is believe in Him and trust in Him and accept this free gift and we can have eternal life that we can be forgiven, that we can have hope in this life. You know, this is something that we get to go and tell other people about. But we are, we are God's plan A. There is no plan B, C, D, E, or F. If we don't go and tell, how are people going to know? You know, we, we've talked about in, in church and and, and many times, you know, we live in a community, LaPorte has 20 some odd thousand people. And 17,000 of those people say, I have no religious affiliation whatsoever. I, I don't believe in any God. I don't go to any church. I don't anything. 17,000 people. Do you realize God loves each and every one of those people just as much as he loves you and me? And we're, we're, we're his plan A to go tell those people about him. 17, that means we got a lot of work to do. Now, hey, we're, we're grateful. We have, there's a lot of brothers and sisters in this, this community. There's Christians that go to other churches and they have the same goal, same mission that we have. And I'm thankful for them because it's way too big of a task than we can do ourselves. But the question is, are we going to go do it? Or are we going to get distracted? You know, we also have... Things that, that scream at us is urgent. You know, you got to deal with this right now. You know, every, everybody tries to vie for attention. You know, everything tries to take your attention off things. And it seems like it's really urgent. you got to deal with this now. But the question is, are we dealing with urgent or important? Because there's some things that's urgent and it wants our attention right now. But if we don't do anything with it, is it really going to make a hill of beans difference? You know, answer this email right now. Your, your, your time is ticking. You won't be able to have this sale. Well, maybe I don't need to buy anything today. Maybe I don't need to look at that sale ad says, you only have 30 minutes to, to buy this or you're going to lose out. You know, have you, have you ever thought about that or ever had that feeling? You know, I'm going to lose out on some opportunity or, or you know, I, I, I've said that I'm going to go this Bible study, but, but they've asked me to do something else and, and oh, I, I might miss a, a something better. You know, this is what our world tries to do. It tries to constantly keep us busy, tries to put things that says, oh, it's urgent. You've got to deal with this now. But the fact of the matter is it might not be important. You could just let that thing go and absolutely nothing would happen. So I want to leave you with this here as we, we start this, this study in chapter 3. Every day the world will drag you by the hand yelling, this is important, and this is important, and this is important. You need to worry about this, and this, and this. And each day it's up to you. you yank your hand back, put it on your heart, and say, no, this is what's important. You know, we, we, we all have these distractions. You know, we, have, we all are gifted with 24 hours in a day. It doesn't matter if you are the most famous person in the world, the most influential person, or the person that lives on the street. We all have exactly the same amount of time. The question is, what are we going to do with it? Are we going to use it for, for good? Or are we going to sit there and spend hours and hours and hours following distractions that has no purpose, no meaning? Are we just going to dump our time down the drain? Or are we going to use it for something that is worthwhile and eternal? So let's go ahead. Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And, and we start with a warning. And it's a threefold warning, but I think it's talking about the very same people 
because, you know, the, Paul is writing to the church in Philippi there, and the gospel has been spreading, the church has been growing. This is about 10 years after he originally goes to Philippi. And so he has this warning in here. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write is the same thing as you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and no confidence in the flesh. So what is he talking about here? Well, there was a group of people that, that seemed to follow in behind Paul and they were trying to cause problems with these Greek, these, these uh, Gentile Christians. These people who were not Jews before they were, they were Roman or they were Greek that was coming to know the Lord. They hadn't lived with the Old Testament law and all this. And they had people that was coming in. They said, you believe in Jesus, that's great. But now you need to follow the law just like we do. And the fact of the matter is, is Jesus came that because the old law was incomplete. It could, you couldn't get to know, it couldn't have salvation through the law. It was that there, it pointed out how we couldn't do it on our own. It was there to show us that, hey, you need a savior because you can't do this. And they were saying, if you don't follow law, you're not really saved. You have to, you have to be, you have to be a Jew and then you can be saved because, you know, you have to do this. And so he's warning against these people. And, and what, what's funny is, is he's warning this. He calls them dogs first. Now, this is really important because now we, we, we love dogs now today. You, you might have one at home or at least you know that, that America in general has this, you know, uh, sweet disposition of dog. Dogs were not considered to be a great thing back in that day. They were sort of, you know, these, these uh, you know, pests and they, they were all this sort of stuff. And to call somebody a dog was basically saying, you're lower than a person. You're not worth time and effort. And so he calls these people dogs. And this was, this was really a big insult. Paul is saying, hey, these people that are trying to tell you, you have to go and do the old, they were like dogs. They are less than. And so he tells, calls them dogs. They're evil workers. And he says, beware of the mutilation. They were saying that, you know, you have to go and be circumcised. Now, we're a mixed company. We have some young ears. I won't go in. You, look it up if you don't know what it is. Most adults know what that is. It's not exactly the most uh, comfortable thing in the world, especially if it's done later in life. Uh, that being said, he's saying, don't, don't worry about it. Don't listen to these people. Because he says, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus have, and have no confidence in the flesh. He's saying, what I do bodily doesn't matter. It's what I do in the spirit because this body is corrupted. You know, fact of the matter is, is our earthly body, you know, when we die, it's not coming with us. We're going to get a heaven. We're going to get a new body. That's what Jesus said is we're going to be, have a body that's like his. His body never ages. It never gets sick. It never gets tired. We're going to have a body like this. This, this dirt sack that we're in, it's going to, it's going to be used up someday. We're, we're not going to live in it forever. But our soul, our mind, it, it, that's, that's what continues on. And we will have a new body. And saying, don't, don't worry about the earthly body. It's, it's, that's, that's not what, what's important. It's what, what you believe, what, who you are. Do you trust in Christ? And so, as he's putting this, uh, we're going to continue on in verse 4 through 7. Because he's saying, he's going to be showing how if anyone could have confidence in the flesh. If anybody could, by what he did in his life, have confidence. Paul was the top Top banana. He was the guy in charge. And so let's see what he says here. Verse 4. He says, Though I also may have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which was in the law, blameless. He says, but the things which were gained for me, these I have counted loss for Christ. You know, let me, let me put it in a different way here. Paul is writing to us and he's saying, if you're talking about the things of, of the flesh, you know, how, who you know, what you do, all this sort of stuff. He's saying, if you think you're good, I was better than you. And you go, well, that, man, that's, that's really prideful. Why is he saying? Because it's the truth. 
He, he was. He was a Jew of Jews. He was, he was, he was blameless. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He, that he was a person of the tribe of, of, of Israel. He was, he was a, a Benjamite. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was taught by the greatest teacher of that generation. He was taught by a man by the name of Gamal. And Gamal, if you wanted to, if you wanted to have the primo education, this being taught under Gamal was the Harvard of the time, or Oxford, or Cambridge, or any of the the, the worldwide amazing schools that you know everybody says, I'm from this school, and everybody goes, oh, ooh. To be taught by Gamal was was it. That was the guy. And you know, we we hold people like influencers and movie stars and sports people in high esteem. They held religious leaders in high esteem. You know, here, here's, here is, you know, the, Paul is saying he's the, he's the Michael Jordan of his day. He's the Kobe Bryant. He's, he's the greatest of them all. He, and he talks about, he says, as, uh, concerning the law of Pharisee, he says, I followed the law to the nth degree. I, he says he followed the letter of the he he did everything. He he was he was even tithing of his spices. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine, you know, get when you're talking about giving a tenth of your stuff, going in your spice cabinet and opening up, you know, all your different spices and giving a tenth of all your spices? I mean, you go, man, that's that's a little overkill. It that's exactly what they did. And you go, well, how? You know, they, they went through and it talks about that, yes, the Pharisees even, even did that. They went to the littlest thing. He says that concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. He thought when he was out there, he was, he was throwing Christians in jail. He thought, I'm standing for God. I'm stopping this little upstart group before anything happens. And we remember what happened. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus as he was going, he was going outside, he was going into another country to find Christians and bring them back. He didn't want Christianity spreading across the world. He thought, I'm doing this for God. And remember what, what happened is, is he, he sees the bright light and Jesus speaks to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Remember Saul looks up and he says, who are you, Lord? And he says, I'm, I'm Jesus. I'm the one that you're persecuting. And, and his whole life changes. He's saying concerning righteousness which is in the law. blame. If you looked at him, if you said if there's anyone worthy as follows, following the law to receive righteousness, to receive eternal life, Saul, Saul, Paul, he would have been your guy. He was the guy that if there was anyone who could complete the law and, and do everything that God wanted him as, in human terms, he was the guy. But I want you to see how he puts this. He says, But the things that were, were gained into me, these I have counted for, to loss for Christ. He says, All this glory, all this accolades, me being the best of the best, I count it as garbage for God, for Christ. Can you imagine? You know, that we would have somebody that was so, you know, they, they would just take all their fame aside, cast it aside to just chase after Jesus. But, you know, we have some of those people, don't we? We have some movie stars that are very open about their faith. And, you know, everybody, you go, oh, we, we don't like these people anymore. We don't want anything to do. You know, they're willing to give up their fame, their fortune, their, all this stuff for, for, to let people know about Jesus. And this is what Paul did. You know, he's talking about a new life in Christ is better than the old life at its very best. He's saying, I had it all. But I count it all as, as loss. And so he's encouraging us, stop chasing after the world's version of success. Stop trying to be the rich and the famous. Stop trying to be an influencer or gain power and authority. He's saying, leave it alone. Stop it. Because all that stuff is worthless when it's compared to Christ. Do you realize you can have the most precious thing in the world, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're famous or not, the greatest thing this world has to offer is Jesus. And if you've attained it, my goodness, you've, you've obtained a pearl of a great price. And so he says, stop chasing, stop going after this stuff. So let's keep going. Verse 8 says, Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. I want to stop there for just a second. 
That word rubbish, okay, we go, oh, he, he counts as trash, you know, the th- scraps you throw out. No, I, I want you to understand that word is much stronger than that in the re- language he wrote that in, okay? I want you to think of the most disgusting, filthiest thing you can think of. Everybody have that picture in your mind? The grossest thing you just, ugh, you know, whatever that you just can't stand. That's the word he's using, okay? He is using the word for the most grossest, disgust. I, I've had three kids. We all know what I'm thinking of as the most disgusting thing in the world. And it is. Oh, my goodness. Some of those diapers. I, I, I still have nightmares. <laughs> this is what Paul is calling all the, the great, all the accolades of life, everything you can get, he's calling it dirty diapers. Dirty diapers. This is, this is pretty extreme, isn't it? I mean, think about this. All the fame, fortune, glory, honor, all that sort of stuff. He's saying, compared to Jesus, it's dirty diapers. A little bit stronger than the word rubbish that we use in English, right? Okay, so let's, take, let's keep going here. So continuing on from, from verse 8 there, verse 9. He says, and be, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through, the faith, or through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and, the fellowship, and fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death, if by any means I may obtain to the resurrection from the dead. He's saying, if... if if I can give all this stuff and I count it as dirty diapers, I would rather have the suffering of Christ if it means that I get to, to also celebrate in His resurrection. Do you realize that when we do baptism, that's really what we're talking about is being united with Christ? You know, when I, when I do a baptism, you know, I ask people, you know, have you, given, have you asked the Lord to forgive you of your sins? And, and you know, whatever the person answers... And when I tell them, because of your confession and faith, if they say, yes, I believed in Jesus, I've asked Him, forgive me of my sins. Do you want to be counted as one of His followers? Yes, I want to be counted as one of His followers. You know, I say, buried in likeness of His death. That we're saying, I'm, I'll take on what Jesus went through. It is worthwhile. Identify me with Christ. You know, even, even if I have to suffer, it's worth it. Because we're also raised to walk in newness of life. That because of what Christ did, that we are a new creation that we we don't have to have the same failings and weakness that we have before we can be who god wants us to be we have the holy spirit that can give us the ability to overcome the the struggles that we have that we can have hope in this life and he's saying if if by any means i may obtain the resurrection from the dead and you know what the funny thing is 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 we look at this and we see another set Of course he can do that because that's what Jesus died for. That we would be united with him. He would be the firstborn of of those resurrected. That we would follow in his footsteps. That we would have eternal life because of what he did. And he's saying, if I can obtain that, I will take on all of that. Throw away the dirty diapers of fame and fortune. Give me the sufferings of Christ. That's That's a tough statement, isn't it? Do you realize what he's saying? He's saying, I would rather be in jail. I would rather have this, this Roman soldier attached to my wrist than to have the fame and the fortune and all the honor and glory. He was the crim of the, the de la crim. He was the, the highest of the high. He would have been, you know, it's, it's quite possible, had he been a Levite, that with all the, the things that he did, that he could have probably ended up being high priest. He was, he was the top. The only thing that was preventing him from being high priest was he was from the tribe of Benjamin. But he could have been one of the top dogs of the Sanhedrin. He could have been one of the top Pharisees. He could have had all the power and authority, had the people ooing and awing over him. He says, that's dirty diapers. Give me the suffering of Christ. Wow. Powerful statement. So let's see what else he writes here. Saying, verse 12, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. 
Can you imagine? I mean, here's, here's Paul. We're going to read those other verses there, but, but he's saying, I haven't obtained it yet. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read through the Bible, man, I, I look at Paul and I'm like, man, I wish I could be a Christian like that. I wish I could make those statements that he does. I wish I could say, hey, if you want to follow Christ, follow me. Follow my example, because if you, if you do what I do, you're going to be walking like Jesus. Man, I wish I could say stuff like that. I look at this guy as, as, as probably one of the greatest, if not the greatest Christian that ever lived. And he's saying, I haven't got it yet. I haven't figured it all out. I haven't got there. He says, but I press on. I press on that I may lay hold of that which, of, for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. That I can be who he wants me to be. Because Jesus gave his life for me that I would be something better. This is what Christ is. He wants me to reach the goal. And so I keep striving because I haven't got there yet. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Now this is, this is huge because, you know, all those times we trip and we fall and we don't measure up, He's saying, let, let that stuff behind. Keep pressing towards the goal. Keep reaching for it. Keep striving. Do you realize when we fall and we, we get down, we dust ourselves up and we keep going? That's what he's telling us to do. Keep striving. Keep going. Keep reaching for the goal that we can do better. Press on. So I got a question for you. Anybody know anything about horses? Okay, we got a few people, okay. Why do horses wear blinders? To keep them on track. Them on track. They, they need to focus because horses are great, but they're prey animals. And so they have eyes on the side of their head, and so they look all around. They have a huge field of view. It's like 270 degrees or something like that. And if you have something that happens way over here, it can startle the horse, and they'll, they'll start walking away from it, or they'll jump, or they'll startle and if you're riding a horse or the horse is pulling a carriage, that's not a good thing. <laughs> that can be a little scary. And so they put blinders on horses to keep them focused on what's ahead and not the flashing lights, not the things that could scare them, not the things coming up on the side of them, to keep them focused. Well, you know, the problem is, is I don't know about you, but have you ever noticed that you're kind of like a horse in your life? I know I certainly am. So maybe we need blinders. Maybe we need to have some blinders and focus on the goal. And so this is what Paul is telling us. Focus. Keep your eyes on the prize. Keep your eyes on Jesus. That's why I love that statue back there. Because every time I look back there, I see Jesus. I see him. He's who I'm, he's who I'm doing this for. I'm not doing it to have people say, oh, I was a good servant pastor. Or have people clap for me or cheer for me. It's I want to do what he wants me to do. I want to share his word because that's what he's called me to do with my life. And he's called you to do the same thing. You realize he's called everyone to go and be witnesses. Not just me. But we have to keep those blinders on that we're focused on him and not focused on the stuff of this world. So let's keep going. Verse 15. Verse 15. It says, Therefore let us as many as are mature... Have this mind, if anything you think, if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already obtained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. So, is we is he saying, you know, let, let's keep this in mind, let's hold on, let's let's keep the blinders on, let's keep focused on the race, let's keep doing this. He's saying, if any of you disagree, if anyone is saying, I know Jesus, I have a relationship, I'm just comfortable. He's saying, may Jesus reveal to you, don't be comfortable, keep going. Keep going, keep running the race. Because we haven't obtained yet, we haven't got there. You know, if you think, I, I, I'm, I'm good enough, I've done enough, I'm going to ask you a question. Are you as strong as a Christian as Paul? Can you, can you tell me, you know, if you want to follow Jesus, you follow my example. Can you say that? I can't. Can you? 
Because Paul said, I haven't obtained. I haven't run the race. I haven't finished. I haven't got to where I need to go. So if you can't say that about yourself, if you can't claim the same things Paul claimed, we're not there yet. we got to keep running. And so don't stop when you're tired. Stop when you're done. This race, it gets tiring sometimes. It's hard. You know how, how difficult it is when, when you know that the Lord wants you to serve, but no one gets up and serves with you? When you know that you need to share the gospel with people, but no one else will share with you? you may, why am I doing this? No one else is running with me. Who, who's your audience? Is it everyone else? Or is it Jesus? But I want you to think, if you're the one of the people that's watching the person run the race... Do you want to encourage them? Do you want to be there for them? Do you want to help them as a brother and sister in Christ? You know what the best thing you can do is? Run the race with them. Go serve. You know, you see somebody trying to to tell people about Jesus? Go with them. Hey, brother, how you doing? Talk about, man, I tell you what, I love Jesus too. You know, oh, I heard you talking. You know, have you ever seen somebody sharing the gospel? Have you ever thought about being there and encouraging, helping them? Have you ever thought about, you know, being there for your brother and sister in Christ if they're struggling in their their life? Being able to walk beside them and say, hey, I see you're struggling. Let me encourage you. Let me pray with you. Let me help you. You know, this is the grace. Don't just stand there and be a fan going, woohoo, yay, raw Jesus. Don't be a fan in the stands. Be a player on the field. Be a runner in the race. And that is the most encouraging thing in the world. You know, have you ever seen a marathon being run? Do you know one of the worst things in the world is for a marathon runner is to be all by themselves? Because they're running the race, but then they're getting tired and they're like, I don't know, are they behind me? What's going on? And you start seeing the pack start catching up to them. And you know, these person that bolted out, man, they're in the lead, but then they get tired and they sort of fade away. Do you realize that, that that pack where everybody's running together, they drive each other on, they're encouraging each other, come on, let's finish the race, let's get it. That if you're running with a group of people, you're not going to fade away, you're going to be encouraged, you're going to continue, you're going to finish the race. When you see the person that's going, <gasps> grab a bottle of water for them, splash it on them, give them water, say, hey, are you okay? Let's keep going. That's what we're to do. We're to encourage each other, to be there for each other, run the race with each other. Don't stop when you're tired. Stop when you're done. Verse 17. Brethren, join in following my example. And note those who so walk, as you have have for us a pattern. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you that even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also earnestly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that may be conformed to His glorious body according to the working by which He is able even to subdue all things to Himself." What is Paul writing? He's talking about some people, you know, have you ever seen people that come to church for a little while? And they get all excited. It's like, woo, let's do this stuff. But they never plant roots. They never grow in Christ. They have, they have a faith that's this deep. And as soon as they fin- get that one struggle, boy, they're out. They're out. They disappear. You never see them again. You ask them about Jesus. Ah, that, that Jesus thing. Uh, uh. Have you seen that? I've seen that. It breaks my heart. You know, there, there was a family that I, I knew a long time ago that, that they came in. They were all excited about the Lord and all this sort of stuff. And then they disappeared and I started me- messaging them. And they said, oh, um, well, we're busy and we got this. And, and eventually they just stopped talking to me at all. Wouldn't even make excuses. I, and I, I go and find out and now, you know, their marriage is rocky and this is going on and that's going on. I'm like, what happened? You were doing so good. Why? It's because they they didn't, they they looked at the things of the earth. They didn't put the blinders on and they said, but I I like this. And they put the things of earth above the things. You know, we're not citizens of earth. 
Our passport says our home is heaven. We're strangers in a strange land. Are we going to go to our home? Or are we going, but I, but I just love this earth. I just love it. Because when we start following the thing, we, you know, you're, either a, a, you're either a friend with God or you're a friend with the world. If you decide to be a friend with this world, you make yourself an enemy of the Lord. You know, when we look at all the stuff we got going on, we, we have this social awareness culture now, and oh, we got to do all this sort of stuff. And I've seen some people who were very strong Christians who got themselves caught up in all this stuff. And the fact of the matter is, is, is when you look at it, what does God say? God says, we're one blood, one race. In fact, that's what genetics says. When, when you look, there is more difference inside a color group you know, whatever color you say, there's more genetic difference in that group than somebody of different colors. Do you realize that? That there is no such thing as races. We're the human race. There is one race. You might have a different shade of color in your skin. You might have more melanin than someone else. You know what? I have green eyes. Green eyes are incredibly rare. Unless you live in one of, or have, have heritage from one of two countries. Ireland and Germany. In Ireland and Germany, you're just like everybody else. But anywhere else in the world, you're really rare. Guess where my heritage comes from? Ireland and Germany. Surprise, surprise, right? You know, so I, you know, I might be genetically more different than you. But it doesn't mean we're not all human. One blood, one race. Do you know when they, when they look at, in, in all the scientists, and they look at the genetic profile, do you realize if you ask a biologist, where did the human race come from? Humanity, as we know it today, they will say, traces back to one man and one woman. One of each. Huh, that looks suspiciously like what the Bible says. Huh, you mean science is saying exactly what the Bible says? Yes, it is. And they say, oh, well, the universe had a beginning. Man, that's suspiciously like what the Bible says. That in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And He says, let there be light. And there was light. Oh my goodness. But the fact of the matter is, well, well, we we just can't believe. They want you to believe in something. Do you realize if you're you're going, I've just got to believe in evolution. I've got to believe in the You have a religion. It's called the religion of science. And your religion changes all the time. You know, they just had a huge new revelation when they got this James Webb telescope up. This new telescope. It goes farther. they like, we're going to look farther back towards the beginnings and stuff. And they thought, we're going to see farther away and see galaxies that are farther away. And they were expecting to see galaxies that were like these proto-galaxies and all this sort of stuff. And you know what they actually found? That as they look farther and farther away, all the galaxies look like the galaxies are here. They have the same type of stars and all that sort of stuff. And they go... Boy, that just doesn't match with what we were expecting. And now all of a sudden they're coming up with new theories and new ideas because, well, it doesn't look like we were expecting, so we, we've, we've got to change it. But do you know what it still looks like? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then when it gets to day four, and he made the stars also. You want to talk about the greatest, greatest mic drop in history? God who speaks the universe and creation and all of everything into existence, except for mankind they makes by hand, which is cool enough. But all the galaxies, all these uni- all this stuff so far out, we look and we look and we look and we see all this stuff. And he made the stars also. Boom. There you go. So what about us? What should we learn from this as we close? I want to give you Matthew 6.19. He says, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Store up your treasures in heaven. Don't hold on to the things of this earth. Run the race. You are a citizen of heaven. We are running the race to be more and more like Jesus in this life. And we may never finish the goal. We we might not be exactly like Christ when the Lord says, okay, you've done your job. You've done enough. Come home. But He will make us like Him. When we get get that, that perfected body, when we get the body that the Lord has promised us, we will be like Him. We will have a body like His. We will understand the things that we can't quite grasp. We'll get get them. We'll, We'll understand. 
we will, we will fin- he will finish that work in us that he started. It says he's faithful and just finished the good work. He's going to finish the job. And he will. But the question is, are we going to run to that now? Are we going to quit fighting him? Or are we going to say, Lord, help me be more like you? Let me run this race. Let me, let me run. Well, I'm tired. Lord, help me keep running. Give me the strength. Give me the power. Give me the ability to keep running. And not get distracted by the things of this world. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this time to, Lord, keep running. Lord, that we look at the life of Paul and Lord, he counted, man, he had it all. And he says he counted it as rubbish. He counted it as dirty diapers of all things. And Lord, my relationship, Lord, I wish I could say that I, I'm still not there. I'm still growing. I'm still still developing. Lord, I pray that I will continue to grow. I'll continue to run the race. Lord, help me put the blinders on. Help me not to see the things that are trying to distract me. Help me not get caught up in the, the urgent, but let me get caught up in the important. Lord, help me to, to look at the things that are really, truly important, the things that have eternal significance, not the things that are short-lived. Lord, I've seen too many people that have devoted their life for the short term. Lord, I need to get this. I need to save up for this thing or that thing or whatever. And Lord, they just devote their life every waking moment to that thing. And then they have it and they're not happy. But Lord, a relationship with you, Lord, that that just keeps growing and getting sweeter each and every day. Lord, it is the greatest thing we can ever have. But Lord, we don't want to stop there. We don't want to be incomplete Christians because you called us to be your witnesses. Because, Lord, it is the greatest gift that the world has ever given. It's the greatest thing that's ever happened. But, Lord, we can hold on to all of it and yet give it all away. As we see people that are hurting or that, that's, that's lost and in need of help, Lord, help us to encourage them. Lord, let us share the good news of who you are. And, Lord, that we would be willing to have people make fun of us. We, we'd be willing to suffer and have difficulty in this life that we can see you lifted up high. Because, Lord, this world is temporary, but eternity is not. Lord, I don't want to see people go and be and say, you tell them, depart from me, I never knew you. Lord, that is the saddest thing I've ever read. Is, Lord, let them not reject you. Lord, we pray that we would be faithful and share the good news. Help us to be mighty for you. Help us to run the race. And, Lord, if we're struggling, if we're... We're panting on the sidelines, and Lord, we just think we can't go anymore. Lord, I pray that that you would encourage us, give us strength to go, but Lord, that brothers and sisters in Christ would stand beside us, offer us a drink of water, and say, come on, let's go. Because Lord, we, we haven't finished the race yet. We've got more to run. Help us to run with endurance. We pray all these things in your holy name, Lord Jesus. Amen. As we continue joining us today, we would love to have you come and visit us at Calvary Baptist Church. We're located at 1808 I Street, LaPorte, Indiana. Service times are 9.30 a.m. for Sunday school, 10.30 a.m. for the main service. Or check us out on Facebook at CBC LaPorte.